Hello, people. We're live. How nice to see you here. If you're watching the recording of this, this is not live, obvs. But if you'd like to join the next live live, just look below and there's a link which will take you through to the website lesson stream and um, you'll be invited to sign up for the lesson stream post, get this free lesson plan, and then you'll be notified. This is a, a, a kind of regular session we do. This is lesson stream live. This is exploring possibilities for using story and storytelling in the classroom. Um, nice to see you here. Let me just uh, bring up my my friend and colleague, um, Nicola Meldrum. Hello, Nicola. How are you today? Hello, Jamie. I'm well. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Where's here? That looks like you're standing or sitting in front of some wardrobe. I am actually, yeah. <laughs> They've got little Donald Duck and um, Tweety Pie handles. It's a child's room. <laughs> that will be your daughter's room when she was a proper child, I'm assuming, right? <laughs> yes, it was. She's not a proper child anymore, is she? No, it's, now it's my office. And I kind of <laughs> hide the, the childish handles like that. <laughs> And hello, Tatiana. And hello, Peggy. Oh, from Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. Wow. Have you ever been to Phoenix, Nicola? No. It's Have you ever been to Arizona? No. Have you ever been to the United States? Yes. Okay. We, we got there by moving one shift back from specificity at a time. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what we're doing today everybody do you know what we're doing today nicola do you know what this is all about i think it's got something to do with a fish well it's funny you should say that um because the idea here i look some the late comers who are always excused hello lisa hello mary lovely to see you here um this is all about today i want to explore a story you see the most recent lesson plan in the lesson stream membership is called the story of the maverick fish and uh, there's a few lesson stream members here who i assume will be familiar with this story but uh, there's people who are not if you don't know this story don't worry because we're going to tell it but i want to just ask you a couple of things before we get the the, the story nicola have you have, are you because nicola's not actually based in barcelona as i am this is me in my Barcelona flat. How far away from Barcelona are you, Nicola? I'm about half an hour on the train in a little place called Sitges, south of Barcelona. But you spend quite a lot of time in Barcelona, don't you? Yeah, I come in most weeks. So I'm wondering if you've noticed around the city all of these little tiny paper fish stuck onto windows, stuck onto doors, stuck onto the side of buildings, mm. lampposts, even dogs. No, that's a lie. I've never seen them stuck on dogs. But do you know what I'm talking about here? Have you seen them? No, I haven't seen them. Because once you spot them, you, you can't stop spotting them. Once they've been seen, they cannot be unseen. And uh, this is this here is an example. This is a door that's just around the corner from where I live. And if you look closer, you'll see that there's all these little paper fish. And the artist whose name is Peces Poya, which in Spanish is a little bit rude, isn't it? Peces Poya yes. <laughs> is a mystery, a mystery street artist. Nobody knows their true identity. Um, but this individual must spend hours, I mean, hours at nighttime, I'm going to assume, when the streets are quieter, sticking on these little paper fish. Look at this one. This is another one just around the corner from where we are. Hello, Lisa. Lisa knows Sitches, she's just said. Um, and uh, here's, uh, I, I like to, I, I love these so much. I, I put a few pictures on my on the lesson stream Instagram account. Here's me with a nice fishy background. Um, here, they, they get everywhere, they really do. I said dogs, they don't really get onto the sides mm. of dogs, but look, here's an old, do, do you know what that is? Does anyone here not know <laughs> what that actually is? <laughs> is there to you? I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Are all the fish different? I. I assume they, they actually have to be different because this person 
I'm assuming just traces them onto a piece of paper, cuts them out. Therefore, for mm. practical reasons, every single one will be, will be. Wow. <laughs> Penny says that's a great picture of me. Thank you, Penny. You're you're too kind. I'll take that because I'm I'm firstly not very photogenic, but secondly, turning fifty this year. <laughs> but Nicola does gets tired of me reminding her about. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um. But uh, I mean, look, that is, as we said, that's a, a, a public phone. A lot of maybe the younger people watching us won't know what a public phone is. But there was a day when you used to be, you know, you didn't have to carry your mobile phone around. They didn't exist. And you could actually go to a public phone, put in a coin, make a call. You know, isn't that fantastic? I mean, if they could return, it'd be a great opportunity presented to all of us. We wouldn't have to take our mobile phones with us around we could leave them at home um and look at this one sometimes they appear as individuals nice. <laughs> lisa turns 52 or 50 as well wow i'm assuming that's what you're saying and uh i'm just going to post that comment because you're too kind mary um so so let me just show you a quick close-up of this um we've this is a, i really like this i really like this uh picture. This is just to give you an idea. And I'm going to give you a quick task here, everybody who's watching. If this was a work of art in a gallery, which it's not, but if it was, and you were the street artist, Pethys Poya, who created it, or maybe you're a curator, and if you had to give it a title, what title would you give this piece of art? Type your answer into the chat. What title would you give this piece of art? What would you give this piece of art as a title, Nicola? What would your choice be? Would you would you have anything up your sleeve? Mm. I'm not very good at thinking of titles on the spot. I think maybe something to do with city aquarium or city fish or... Well, for somebody who's not very good at thinking of titles <laughs> up on the spot, I would say that's pretty awesome. <laughs> city <laughs> aquarium. <laughs> How about how about if we we do this collaboratively and I I take your city aquarium and come back at you with street aquarium? That's better, yeah. I I think Peggy is is has a much better suggestion. <laughs> Peggy, that's an interesting one. Swimming upstream, could you? What what's your? Do you have a reason, specific reason for? for naming that. Urban fish, says Lisa, nice. Chaos, says Mary. Um, yeah, what's your, what's your, um, your, your reason for calling swimming upstream? Is that because these fish that you see are actually swimming upstream? Um, I assume that's the reason, but maybe you've got another reason. So that was just a little introduction. That really has not got much to do with the story at all, does it, really, Nicola? No. The story, as we know, is called the story of the maverick fish. Peggy, it's what life is often about. <laughs> I agree. So I think what we've got to do then is we've got to we've got to we've got to tell you the story. And I'm going to suggest that uh, Nicola reads the story out. How do you feel about that, Nicola? That's okay. Yeah. Let me just open it up. It's a very short story. I think if we if we were to describe it, give it a genre, we could call it flash fiction. Flash fiction is a very short story, maybe just a, a few hundred words. Um, it's a genre in its own right. Um, and uh, this probably is representative of what flash fiction is all around all about. So do you do you feel um do you feel ready to read this story out yes, to us, I've Nicola? My, I've had my sip of water. Okay, I've had your good. sip of water. <laughs> Let us then in that case listen to to Nicola reading the story of the Maverick Fish. Okay. Once upon a time, a visitor visited an aquarium. She saw sharks, rays, clownfish, surgeonfish, 
a sunfish, an octopus, snails, hermit crabs, and even penguins. But the thing that got the visitors' attention was a shoal of little fish swimming around and around in their tank. There must have been a thousand of them, and they were all swimming in the same direction. For a few minutes, the visitor stood in front of the tank and contemplated the shoal. She marvelled at how incredible it was that these tiny individuals should come together and behave like a much larger creature with a mind of its own. But just as the visitor's own mind was racing with Buddhist-like thoughts, she noticed something interesting. A single solitary fish swimming in the opposite direction. Whereas the rest of the shoal was swimming clockwise, this little maverick was going anti-clockwise. The visitor was both fascinated and confused. She wondered what could possibly motivate the fish to behave in such a peculiar way. Overcome with curiosity, she decided to look for an answer and she turned to the only aquarium employee in the area, a security guard. The security guard seemed to know what the woman was going to ask even before she asked it. He <laughs> smiled and nodded all the way through her question. It's fascinating, isn't it? The security said the security guard. And do you know what makes it even more incredible? It's always the same fish. If you look closely, you'll see a tiny mark just above its eye. But why does it swim in the opposite direction to the rest of the shoal? Well, I have often wondered that myself. I have even asked the marine biologists who work the, here if they, have, if they can explain. They are humble enough to admit that they don't know the answer. But do you know something else? I have had many conversations with other visitors about that fish. In fact, if I had to guess, I would say that for every thousand people who stand in front of that tank, the one person will notice the fish and ask me about it. Sorry, one person will notice the fish and ask me about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well read. I wonder if um, I can't. You know, I wonder if everybody got it because in the classroom, um, in the lesson plan, students are given the text to read in their own time, and I found that it's not always immediately obvious what the story is about, or rather, the ending. Let's say. Um, there's a few comprehension questions to check that students have understood it, you know, included in the lesson plan. Where does the story take place? What well, takes place in an aquarium? How many people are involved in the story? Actually, what would you say to that question, Nicola, just because there was some dispute? How many people are involved in the story? What would you say? Two. Yeah, you agree with me. The, the other visitors are mentioned aren't they? And also mm. the fish the, the fish are uh, featured, but they are not people. And yeah. another comprehension question for students, what is unusual about the maverick fish? This word maverick being a person that demonstrates behavior which is different to the norm or thoughts that are different to the norm. What's unusual about the maverick fish and the idea is quite simply, it swims in the opposite direction to the rest of the show. They all swim one way, it swims the other. And there's a bit of a trick question here. What do you think of the ending? What does it mean? Um, or rather, the, the question is, um, what, why does the maverick fish behave in this way? It's a bit unfortunate, I think, sometimes. Students are not, too, and, and people in general are not too happy that they never get to find out the answer to why the fish is swimming in this way. Um, but the story creates this, parallel doesn't it between the behavior of the fish in the tank and the behavior of the visitors that pass through the the aquarium and um, penny liked your story your storytelling thank you peggy <laughs> sorry i called you penny i meant peggy let me just explain this is a story that you never heard this until recently did you nicola no it was new to me because I remember it from my school days. I remember it from years ago. I don't know where it came from. I don't remember who told it to me. I don't remember the title. I don't remember who wrote it. I don't remember anything about the story 
all I remember is the story itself. And I have, I used to love this story. It's obviously, and I don't know why this is, it's obviously a Rami, it obviously affected me. It impacted me in, in some way or another. So the text that Nicola's just read to you was my attempt to rewrite the story um, as I remember it. And um, what what do you think of the text, Nicola? If we we're going to break this down, what do you think of the the text as, let's say, a source of of language to use in the classroom? Before we get to kind of, um, you know, what is the story about, discussion issues, looking at the story as a, a source of language, do you do you mm. is do you, do you like it at all as a language teacher? Because um, it is what we refer to as a piece of um, authentic material, isn't it? Yes, it is. I think it's got lots of opportunities for different focuses or foci, hasn't it? Mm. Um, it's You've got the kind of story markers at once upon a time, but the thing that got um, for a few minutes, but just as. So you could kind of use it for, for um, helping students write their own stories. Um, and there's lots of nice um, adjectives as well, fascinated and confused, um, and the fascinating and fascinated. So there's lots of things you could you could use, or you could draw the learners' attention to. Yeah, definitely. In in the lesson plan, by the way, there's two whole pages which support students in their their language comprehension, their familiarity with the specific words, phrases, and features of the text so that we can get them to what we could call um, zero uncertainty, which is a term that I quite like. Have you come across that term before, Nicola? No. Zero. You know zero. It, it was, a, it was a, a term that came to me through Scott Thornbury's website. It's not his term, but the idea is that once you're working with a text, a short text like this, is a natural tendency for any anybody, not let, you know, to want to arrive at some stage where they have no more questions about the language of the text. And when they reach that stage, it's what we can what we can refer to as zero uncertainty. And as a term, I really really like it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always thinking of that. I think it's. For a short text, I really want students to reach zero uncertainty. I'm not happy just saying, ah, oh, there's some words you don't have to worry about. I think it's mm. too natural uh, an instinct for, for students to want to know every word in a short text. So I try to cater towards that. Mm. But it's funny because mentioning Scott Thornbury, I wonder if there's anybody here who was a lesson stream member as far back ago as maybe two years, because I took this text, I don't know if I ever told you this, Nicola, I took this text to see to, to Scott's house, because Scott lives in Barcelona, and I made a podcast. Um, it's a two-part podcast in which Scott completely just goes to work on this text and uh, looks at what he sometimes refers to as the hidden grammar. And my kind of way is of well, what I was saying to Scott was, with, you know, we can't always find a language point in an authentic text like this. Um, you know, some teachers might focus on things like the past simple, but that's far too obvious, isn't it? Mm. This is, you know, it's just too obvious. And because it's a narrative text, of course, we can use it for the past simple. But Scott has this idea, he says, no, any text can have something to offer if we can get down to what the text is about. And he had a really good idea for a task, which is what I've included in the lesson plan. And Scott, after working with it for a bit, said, well, this is about mental processes. It's about what goes on in a woman's mind in, respond, in response to something that she sees. It's about wonder. It's about amazement. It's about um, attention. It's about cognitive processes. And we went through this text, and he was able to kind of identify about 16 different words and phrases that relate specifically to mental processes. And so we've got things like 
get the visitor's attention, contemplated to marvel at, incredible, her mind was racing, noticed something, interesting, Buddhist-like thoughts. There's more and more of these, but there's a it's very rich in this sort of language. I have to thank Scott for bringing this to, to my attention. And um, this is what the task is. The first task, I should say, is for students to try to identify all these by underlining them. Um, once they've reached, um, or maybe before they've reached zero uncertainty, but it's part of the process in getting them. Um, and so that's kind of the language input. Um, Lisa said that she liked the story because it's made her think about how some learners are so much more curious than others. I'd love to know more about that, Lisa. Nicola, do you consider yourself to be a maverick fish? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you know that after you've said that, you know that I'm going to have to get you to uh, back up your answer with a, a concrete example. <laughs> I think, I think, um, I think I'm a maverick fish because I like to question things and maybe it gets a bit annoying, but I always enjoy taking the contrarian point of view and, and um, even if it's not my own, I, I, let, I think it's valuable to always swim against the tide a little bit or go against the, um, the general consensus to try and point out a different, per to give a different perspective. How does that manifest itself? Because people might not know about this about me, but my my family, my dad, my mum, my brother and sister often call me a pain in the ass because they think I'm contrary. For me, this is something I do, but it manifests itself as me being apparently contrary and argumentative. But perhaps this could just be a process for you that you something you think about, Nicola. What what do you think? Mm. I think it manifests in different ways. I have a similar reaction from my dad and we often have arguments because <laughs> we're, we're um, always trying to point out the other side of the, the argument to each other. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I just genuinely think it's, it's, um, it's probably something that comes from our education, right? Um, to be analytical and to question things. Um, yeah. And, but I think there's value in it, especially in these days. <laughs> Let me show you a few of the, um, the, the questions that um, I like to use in combination with this. Um, just before we get there, I should have mentioned that I particularly like this part of the language focus in the worksheet when students are invited to name these nine animals, which you mentioned, Nicola in the first paragraph of the story. <laughs> I was quite happy with that part. It took me ages to think of this. Before I was just saying, ah, they're all sea animals, doesn't matter. But you know, people want to know. Can you identify that one on the bottom left? G, that's the largest bony fish mm. on the planet. It's huge. It doesn't look very big there. It's only this size, but it's huge. It's called a sunfish. Ramola. Um, but these are some of the, moving on to the actual story itself and the issues that come out of it, these are some of the questions. And it's a very, very natural question, I think, to ask. It's maybe the most fundamental question to, con to come out of this. And I would guess that when you read the story or you hear the story, it's a kind of reflective question. Hmm, can I identify with this fish? Um, can I identify with this visitor? to the museum, sorry, to the aquarium. Um, and then in this sixth question, I asked Nicola, can you think of a time when you swam in the opposite direction to the rest of the shoal, which is kind of a an invitation to share a story perhaps. And now I've been, I've been using this story for, for years, literally with students. I've used it in workshops. I've used it in my courses. Um, and in my experience, I can tell you that this image of a maverick fish that swims in the opposite direction to the rest of the shoal 
is overwhelmingly seen as being a positive one. And I think that some, some of what you said there, Nicola, um, would kind of reinforce that. Would you agree? Yes, I think I think everyone likes to see themselves as um, being the one who questions things. Mm. And that's probably a good thing, right? As Peggy says, it takes courage to swim against the tide of popular opinion. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, can we think of any... Can we think of any famous maverick fish from contemporary culture or from history? And feel free now to type your answers in. And one, you know, students can do this. They, you know, even as a homework, they can find a, an example of a um, a famous maverick fish, or maybe not so famous, somebody they know in their lives, perhaps. And then, very importantly, what did they do in order to swim in the opposite direction to the rest? You know, there's some obvious ones like Steve Jobs, aren't there? He's an obvious maverick fish, although he's no longer with us. Rosa Parks, says uh, Peggy, and uh, you've got to go into the history there. What was the, exactly, what was the the um, shoal, the direction? She was one of a few maverick fish, wasn't she? Um, a lot of fish that wanted to swim in the opposite direction, but she was one of the few who um, actually did it. Um, good example. Keep them coming. Any maverick fish from you, Nicola? Um, I can't think of one. I mean, recently a person who's been in the, the news a lot is Russell Brand. Tell us about him. Well, he's he's someone who I think has been quite critical of the mainstream media recently and even, you know, there, there were, uh, an article was written about him in one of the British newspapers saying he was, um, they were criticising him. And uh, so, th th you know, I thought of, of him as when I, I thought of somebody who's um, a maverick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you sp we've spoken about him before. I've not been listening to his podcast, but I know that you do quite regularly, don't you? And I must give him a listen. Yeah, and he Nelly. tends to have a lot of maverick guests as well, guests who are maverick fish on his his um his show. Um, Nelly's got a great example here. I'm wondering, Nelly, is that the is that the the presenter from Russian TV who protested live and then walked out? Is that? Oh, you've just you've 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 um, backed up with a second. She's a famous Russian actress. Great example. So, you know, every example that you can cite is a potential story. One of the things I'm very interested in is how to get stories from a story using a text like this as a kind of a springboard for students to think of or find or source and then tell stories of their own. Um, Lisa must be psychic because she was thinking of that uh, presenter as well. Um, I think this is a very important question. Um, when might it be important to swim in the opposite direction the rest of the show? And I think that the, the, the suggestion from Nelly is a great example, illustrates a an important situation but maybe because let's just put it into the, the the kind of the way the story is working the shoal right now we being the shoal we're all swimming in one direction and the direction is that it's generally good to be a maverick fish you see what i mean if we were to be a double maverick fish and go against the shoal and you were to argue that in fact it can be bad, then give us an example of why it might be bad to be a maverick fish and uh, maybe back it up with an example. You know, this is, I think this is a very important question. Have you got any ideas of that, Nicola? Well, it could be dangerous. Because you could hit your head off the other fish that are coming towards you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if you're going against um, something important like um, like the example here of a, a kind of the Russian policy in Ukraine, um, and the example of that presenter, right? She 
she um you can get arrested <laughs> it can be dangerous mm. what about for that that's dangerous in the level of the individual isn't it how mm. about at the level the societal level level of society i think david's just posted something that might be related to that hello david that's nice to see you here so that's a really interesting example. Can you, do you want to comment on that, Nicola? Well, I suppose that people who are refusing to be vaccinated, there's, it's, it's a, um, a bit of a can of worms. A can um, of fish. It's, it's a lot more complex than, than maybe we can go into here, but, um, I suppose it can be seen as, as dangerous if you don't take a, a medical advice. And also what's interesting is that there is a big movement of anti-vaxxers, not just for, for, for COVID vaccinations, but all sorts of vaccinations. And this as a movement, if we can call it a movement, maybe it's not precise to call it a movement, maybe it's a sort of way of thinking, it has been traced back to an individual, an individual who um, was, let's say, a maverick fish. Um, I can, well, I'll try and, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll more of that to follow in a little while. Now, Nicola, you're a, Nicola's a, a fish in the fishbowl. The fishbowl is the, um, is the, the, the online community platform where some of us, the members, Lesson Street members, we, we share, we discuss, we network, we make friends. And uh, we've got some, some of us, some fish are present here. Nelly, for example, David, Nicola, um, and I, f I have to scroll back up. Um, but Nicola's, Nicola's, a, Nicola's a recent member to the Lesson Stream membership, a recent fish, and we've been talking about some of these issues. And Nicola's been posting a few things. And recently, Nicola, you posted a, a question or a comment or an invitation, uh, whereas I'm very much about input, I think is one of the things that interests me most, using stories to get students doing stuff, but I'm always focusing on the value of the input as a means to engage students and get them doing stuff, what you're, you're kind of focus, focused on, Nicola, is the language that comes out of students, the output. Am I right in saying that? Yes, you are. Yeah. And could you tell us about the, the comment that you posted in the, in the, fish, in the, the fishbowl recently in response to this, this activity? Yes. I was um, suggesting that, we can take a different or an additional approach to planning lessons when we have an artifact like an authentic text or with any lesson really, um, where we can focus on feedback. So I came up with this acronym um, a few years ago called um, FFP. I don't know if everyone can guess what it stands for while we talk about it. But the idea is that you try and anticipate what your students might um, say during um, a lesson. You might anticipate what problems they'll have, and you might anticipate what language you could give to support them um, in order to help them express themselves more effectively. It's that kind of I plus one, so always thinking like, you know, could I could I feed in something as well as feeding back on their their language? Could I feed in something just to help them express themselves? And it was interesting listening to our conversation because we were saying um, lots of phrases. We were using lots of phrases when we were ask, asking and answering the questions that are above what a B1 or B2 student where this this kind of lesson is is. Um, is recommended for those levels. It's kind of above what they would be able to to use things like to go against um, the crowd, to swim against the tide, and these are lovely phrases, right? And and actually, I wrote down if, if I was going to answer those questions, 
um, I might I might have to try, I might want to try and use phrases like that, like um, I was a maverick fish and in response to question two, can you think of an example of when you were a maverick? I was a maverick when I went against or I was a maverick when I disagreed with. Those are chunks that we can feed in. But, but you know, sometimes it's really hard to come up with those on the spot when you start listening to your students and you think, oh, you know, they, oh, they're struggling with this. They could probably do with some, some little useful phrases. But if we think about um, the potential problems they'll have with their output um, and how we can feed back and feed in, um, we go into the lesson really well armed and well prepared to support them. So another thing is to think about the errors that they might make. So like things like pronunciation of my Spanish learners might say fish um, or maverick. You know, they, 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 they wouldn't be maverick. We might just use two syllables and say maverick. They would separate it into three syllables. So anticipating all of those things that helps us think about how we can correct as well, because error correction is really hard to do well on the spot. But if you anticipate the mistakes before the lesson, um, you can sort of think through how you'll correct them, how you might use the board, what kind of drill you might give. So you might drill fish. You might think, OK, they're going to use a long vowel, so maybe I can come up with like a minimal pair, like fit and feet to show them the, the mouth position. So you're thinking through and, and you go into the lesson um, much better prepared to give feedback. Um, and I think that kind of addresses the balance in planning. It's a nice way to kind of balance your planning so you're not just concerned with the, the input and um, explaining, clarifying, checking, designing tasks to help them reach that level of um, zero, what you called it, Jamie, zero? Zero uncertainty. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're also thinking about how to help them express themselves better for, for the kind of intended communication that's going to happen in the lesson. I like that. It is a, it is, um, there's a couple of questions, just but um, I'll just get to them in a second. But what I take away from from that, I mean, I've Nicola and I have spent a lot of time talking about these things, and uh, you know, Nicola is responsible for me applying this um, a lot more than I used to to the activities that I, I write. You know, for example, going back to this, uh, you know, the. Uh, can you think of a time when you swam in the opposite direction to the rest of the show? Question two. And you suddenly start thinking, well, how is a student going to answer that? Um, and in fact, it's an invitation for a story. So you could maybe give students the first line or preempt it in some way or ask for an example. Um, yes, there was this, there was this once, there was this time when or once when I was at school, or give them the first line, which in my experience is so often this, this, a stumbling, uh, a, a way to stumble from, from storytelling. Um, Penny asked a question. Sorry, Penny, I keep calling Peggy. I keep calling you Penny. Apologies, Peggy. Do you ask students what questions they have about? Do you mean here, Peggy, um, that you ask them questions about the text? I'm not quite sure of the question. Because we have to differentiate this between the, the input and the output. And mm. input, I am suspect maybe Peggy's question refers to the language of the text, whereas Nicola's mm. very much focusing on the output, how students are going to be able to express themselves in response to tasks okay. and maybe questions about issues in the text. Mm. I don't know if I've got that right or not. Well, there's quite an interesting approach that's like, an, I can't remember who came up with the acronym years ago, Tavi and Tallow. I think I learned it on my certificate course and it's a, it's a way of thinking and planning how you're going to use a text and you can use it as a vehicle for information, which means like a springboard to talk about, or you can use it as a linguistic object. 
and usually it's, it kind of does both things, you know. Um, so maybe you can plan your questions around those two things and think about things like CCQs based on what you're using it for and when. So if you're using it to focus on the language, then, um, you know, you would ask questions about that before, maybe before you get them to, to speak about it. And some, sometimes there's a real mismatch between the language in a text and then um, what students say about the text. There's this kind of idea that you can take language from a text and get students to use that language. And that's sometimes really hard because written English is totally different to spoken English. Um, and, and, and that's a big mistake that I see sometimes with them um, when I'm doing teacher training is they assume that they can easily create a speaking activity based on the language in a text rather than thinking of it as a springboard as a vehicle for information so one thing is the receptive understanding of the language in the text and, and checking that and, and helping students understand it another thing is helping students talk about the text but not assuming they're going to use the language from the text in their conversations that's a really good point and this is something we've looked at in quite a lot of detail in the lesson stream story course about register um, because it's such an important and often overlooked aspect of language, isn't it? And I think that's a really good example. Students might want to talk about the story. They want, might want to use language in it, but that language is is at the register of a written story and not necessarily spoken. So a great example. I think and Nelly and, and Peggy um, are asking some questions about this. I think what Nicola's very specifically talking about is the 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 uh, talking about emergent language managing emergent language am i right in thinking that nicola mm, it, yes language which comes from students out of whatever they've got to say whatever they've got to ask whatever whatever they have to produce in response to a question or a task whenever you get there then it's what nicola's thing is about maybe preempting or thinking about what they might say, the problems they might have, the, 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 the obstacles they might have to overcome and trying to preempt that. And it's a really useful far, part of the, did I say fart? Part of the, the planning. Mm, Sorry I if think, I said fart. <laughs> I think um, that leads nicely to Nelly's question. Is it, is it about using CCQs? And and part of my point about this idea of planning for the feedback is that um, you can plan your CCQs and um, um, concept checking questions are really hard to come up with on the spot. But if you've thought about what problems students might have when they express themselves or even what problems they might have with the, 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 the meaning of the words in the text, at least you can kind of plan your CCQs in advance and have them up your sleeve there's there's actually there's so much planning we can do aren't there i think i think often the if the classroom we think of it as a place which sort of fluid and there's so much improvisation going on and there is and there definitely can be but if we're taking t a text and some tasks into the classroom i think we really can do everything we can we we do everything we can in order to prepare ourselves as best as we can and ccq questions concept checking questions definitions that we can provide our students examples we can give to illustrate and um, preempting potential problems students might have when they're producing language these are all a big sort of suite of, of the sort of preparation tools that we can it's a really nice uh way to look at yeah. it and I think yes. the one thing that you can do is is quite good fun as well as you know you just mentioned a lot of things and sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming to decide what to focus on and um, especially if you, you start anticipating and um, what your what language your students might need to talk about the thing and so I, I like to do this thing called try before you buy which is um, doing the tasks with a friend or a colleague <laughs> um before you teach the lesson so in this case you would like you just like we did at the start of this this um, event we discussed the questions and answered them and 
and and that really helps to come up with that language because sometimes it's not easy to come up with a language that you can feed in like to go against the tide but as soon as you you do the task it emerges and sometimes um i used to even record myself um and then listen back to it and find um find useful language Spoke, like spoken grammar, the thing that, that Scott was talking about, this kind of like finding different kinds of language, different register. Sometimes the, the, sometimes we teach this kind of language, it's very formal. Like I hear a lot of students saying things like, and moreover, da 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 da. Mm. And it's just, it just doesn't, doesn't fit. Whereas if they just kind of sat down and had the conversation themselves and asked and answered those questions, they would come up with much better phrases that are more naturally occurring. Yep. It's a wonder if, uh, if that's something that people do here. You know, maybe if you've got a, using a story and you're wondering, it's something I do all the time, if I've got a story and I'm wondering how people are going to react to it or what they might ask about it or what they might say in response to it, I'll share that story with a friend, with you, Nicola, with my, my sister who lives in Barcelona or anyone I know. It's, I find it to be very, very valuable. It's all part of practicing and um, learning. Can I tell you a, um, to, to kind of take this home, a quick story about the story of the maverick fish? It's not much of a story, I have to say. It's more, I think it's maybe my experience of it. And I'm going to tell you about maybe how I've changed my mind personally. Because don't forget, I've been... This story has been in my life since I was maybe 10 years old, I'm going to guess. I've spent some time thinking about it. It's obviously affected me, impacted me, as we mentioned. And I've taken this sort of a little bit of a journey with the story. I'd just like to describe it to you. What I'm going to say is going to be quite opinionated, but I'm taking off my teacher trainer's hat here. This is just me as some guy. All right. Um, I used to use this story... Um, to introduce my course on critical thinking. Um, I wonder if any of you are aware of this course. It's actually called Video and Critical Thinking or Image Video and Critical Thinking. And I wanted to have a, a nice working idea or a nice working definition to illustrate what critical thinking is because critical thinking is a highly problematic term uh, because we lack a solid um, consensus definition of exactly what it is. And therefore, if decision makers start to say there must be more critical thinking in schools, that's problematic if they don't know exactly what critical thinking is. And, you know, if you look at Wikipedia, it very quickly state that there is no, um, there is no shoal swimming in one direction with a good, solid understanding. It's so often conflated, for example, with media literacy. Um, and media literacy is a, a branch in itself. Um, and so when I started my course on critical thinking, I used to offer this definition of what critical thinking is by illustrating it with the story of the maverick fish, you see. And for me, this was a great illustration of what critical thought is. And I would say it that when the shoal is moving one way, the critical thinker will look the other way and start swimming. And I think that's something that we've almost kind of touched upon in the last, um, well, we've touched upon it sometimes since we started this live, I know that. But let me just show you three examples, and this is something else we've touched upon, three examples of maverick fish. And I wonder if you can uh, identify these people. Do you know who this man is? This is most certainly a maverick fish. He's been in and out of the news a lot recently. Um, he's famous for his website, which is called Information Wars, or rather Info Wars. Do you know who this is, Nicola? No, I've heard of the site, but I can't remember his name. This is um, a man called, and I'm slowing down just in case anybody wants to get in here, Alex Jones. Exactly. Peggy got in there just as I said it. And uh, yeah, this is Alex Jones. Now, Alex Jones is, um, he's a very problematic person. He, he, 
he is um he he claimed that the the 2012 Sandy Hook uh shootings um a terrible terrible tragedy took place in the USA the Sandy Hook shootings he Alex Jones claimed it was all a hoax he claimed that it didn't actually happen and he and he and he gave all this sort of conspiratorial reasons none of which of course could be proven um, but just reasons that had been pulled out of thin air. And he used these pseudo reasons to back himself up. Since that, he's been he's actually been taken to, to court. He's He's been forced to pay damages to the victims, the families um, of the, the victims of the Sandy Hook um, shooting. But very interestingly, I was listening the other day to a Guardian in focus no no it wasn't it was the guardian politics usa podcast i don't know if you know that one nicola it's quite a new one and there's a a, a do you know john ronson john ronson yes, he's, I love he's, john ronson he's great isn't he john ronson is is a what do we call him he's a a gonzo what's the word i'm looking for um he's a he's a an investigative journalist and I, and and he he befriended he became friends with Alec Jones years and years ago even before Alex Jones was famous and John Mark John Ronson is an authority in this guy and in this this I've put the link it's already there actually the link to this podcast is underneath the the YouTube window Mark Mark Ronson said and I'm reading this he he said that a court expert diagnosed Alex Jones as having narcissistic personality disorder. And narcissists, according to John Ronson, whose name I think I keep mispronouncing, <laughs> um, John Ronson, um, according to John Ronson, narcissists want to be the smartest people in the room. This is one of the things that defines them. Um, and, and sometimes the way to be the smartest person in the room is to come up with some counterintuitive information that nobody else has and often that's a conspiracy theory and and this man mm. um, John Ronson who has explored conspiracy theorists for years and years uh, says that that narcissists often dominate leadership of conspiracy theory movements which is very interesting mm. there's another really good podcast from the guardian in focus which goes back and explores the source of a recent more relevant conspiracy theory about ukraine the title is how a conspiracy theory about ukrainian inverted commas bioweapons labs took off and it, it really goes into detail about how conspiracy theories is actually it's become uh uh an industry if you can come up with an original conspiracy theory and if you can propagate it and it can take off you can actually dine out on that you can become a name you can make money from it and there's a lot of incentive for people to to become maverick fish and what i'm saying here i think is that in a world of misinformation and conspiracy theories we've always got to ask questions of those who swim in the opposite direction of the, the rest here's somebody else i wonder if you can name this man we referred to him before when david mentioned vaccines and i said we'd come back to it this man is called robert w malone an american mm -hmm. physicist and biochemist um sorry i think i've made a mistake no 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 have I got this right? I may have made a mistake. Yes, this is this is not Robert W. Malone. This is Andrew Wakefield. Apologies. Um, he's a British anti-vaccine activist, former physician, and discredited academic who was struck off the medical register for his involvement in a, in a Lancet autism fraud. This man is often regarded as the individual who is responsible for this movement or this common popular th idea that vaccines cause autism um, and i wonder if you know this man here do you know him don't you nicola yes this is um do you listen to joe rogan um yes sometimes 
they're very long yeah. podcasts. So Joe Joe Rogan is is I wouldn't want to call him a maverick fish myself, but he's a curator. He you know, he we talk about mainstream media and he'll be he talks about anti-mainstream media. Joe Rogan is however you want to define it, mainstream media. His podcast is the most downloaded podcast in the history of podcasts. It, it, it's number one. And so, you know, it, it's all very semantics if we refer to, if we differentiate between what he does and mainstream media. He is by all definitions mainstream and he curates the guests that he has and he's very attracted to maverick fish and he loves to give voices to people for example the person i miss uh, represented uh, before um robert w malone is one of his guests mm -hmm. so you might know that recently robert w w malone this maverick fish an american physician and biochemist who was a an early pioneer of mRNA technology, um, but he's recently um, been promote, promoting misinformation about the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccinations. And this resulted in January this year, a petition signed by 270 very prominent scientists um, to Spotify voicing their, 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 uh, their kind of problem with the kind of thing that this man is doing, what Spotify is giving a voice to. And I think that, you know, I think that years ago, it was a great thing to automatically ask questions. And I think these days we've got to be very, very careful about seeing Maverick Fish as instantly, whoops, <laughs> instantly positive. Because that is a, because it's a very positive image and individuals like the ones we've just been looking at use that to their advantage and uh that's my own story so the, as a little conclusion to my own story rather than seeing the show as being other people i like to see the show as being what i myself believe in and me using that maverick fish story as a way into my critical thinking course and then starting to think actually I'm not so happy with that anymore why is that the case and trying to find a reason so often going against the show is going against your own let's say prejudices perhaps or your own sort of ways of thinking that might be problematic mm -hmm. or or whatever so the show can also be your own brain which is going round and round what do you think about that Nicola? It's an interesting take, and I know that Joe Rogan came under a lot of fire for recent guests that he's had on. Um, but I think, I think it's very, yeah, it's a really complex area, and it's something that I've, I've recently done a course called Sense Making with a group called Rebel Wisdom and this is the essence of what they are looking at is is the kind of current landscape um with, with media because it is getting quite um chaotic and Joe Rogan has way more of an audience than mainstream media does. He's got a bigger audience than many of the big channels in America. Um, but just just because he invites someone on his show to talk about something doesn't mean that he's promoting their ideas. And I think that's this, that's where it gets. That's where I disagree with some of the kind of um, criticisms that have been faced at the likes of him and and other presenters like um, who were we mentioning earlier, like Russell Brand. It, it's just because they have someone on their show to talk about something means that they think that thing too. And they think that everyone else should think that thing too. And I, I think, you know, we don't want to, we don't, we don't want to go down that road of, of um, not giving those people a voice because they're. they're but do you there. think that the, um, because by giving them a, you're still giving them a voice. Let's just put it this way. If you've got the shoal and if you've got the attraction to that one maverick fish, then Joe Rogan gives that one maverick fish a voice because that's what he's specifically attracted to. Whether or not he mm -hmm. says that um, this is the right way, which he doesn't actually, I don't think. 
Um, but you he's still giving questioning that voice to a big audience and using his audience to to question that voice. I think that's that's where it can be really useful. You know, it's not just by giving someone on your show or you could have someone on here that you don't agree with, and that doesn't mean that you just want to bring the debate out into the open and um, and get people thinking about it. I think yeah. we just under, we're starting to underestimate everyone and think that nobody has any ability to discern anything or you know understand from wrong we're sort of <laughs> people can work that out for themselves can't they well on that positive note and that i think just one last thing and this is a this if you use the lesson plan this is a way you control your students not control your students troll them wind them up tease them tell them that they have all failed the maverick fish test do you know what i'm talking about nicola no back to this because i do you can encourage students to spend a lot of time looking at this and thinking about it and coming up with a title and rarely if ever in fact nobody does ever spot that there was a maverick fish Ah, <laughs> I just saw it when you pointed, just before you pointed the arrow, I did. I did, I passed. <laughs> and I'm being silly, of course, because this is not the definition of a maverick fish, but it is in the story, isn't it? Because in the story, that visitor to the aquarium was one in a thousand that spotted the maverick fish. So this is mm. a spotting the maverick fish um, <laughs> activity so you can tell your students they've all failed so everybody's thinking yes i'm a barrack fish you can say no you're not and let them go home with their tails between their legs not that fish have tails do they do they some of them they do. do they don't oh, have what legs a, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> what a silly thing to say of course they have tails but no legs <laughs> yeah good Listen, um, just before we pack up, can I just say something? Um, I really appreciate you spending the time being here. I'd like to say a big thank you to, to Nicola um, and thank you to you all for being here. This is a regular thing. It's going to start once a week. At the, at the moment, it's every twice a week. But I would be so, so grateful if you could share these with your friends and with your colleagues. They're free. I want to be able to offer ideas for, for teachers. We're using story in the classroom and storytelling. So please, please share these events with your teacher friends. And if you're, and of course, there's always the, the lesson stream membership. And um, for anyone who's who would like to join it, just go to lessonstream.com. Um, and you get access to the community we mentioned. This is the platform online, the fishbowl that Nicola and I are both part of. You'll see us regularly. You get access to the Lesson Stream Story Course. Um, you get access to the, the Lesson Stream Lesson Plan Libraries. Um, there are almost, well, there's 98 lesson plans. Currently there, you get instant access to all of them. The story of the Maverick Fish being the most recent one, and uh, you get the Fishbowl Weekly, which is your weekly newsletter. And this is all for €8.99 per month or 89 90 a year. And if you're thinking about joining, my advice would always be just join, because if it's not for you, if you feel it's not right for you for whatever reason, um, just let me know and I'll give you a, a money back. I'll give you your money back. That is the money back guarantee. All right. Um, so if you're not with us already, do join us. You will not you will not regret it. Am I right, Lesson Stream members who are here right now? <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you so much to, to you, Nicola. What Thank are you, you having for your dinner tonight, Nicola? I have no idea. <laughs> And it's Maybe some fish, not some fish. I had fish last night. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> I ate a maverick fish. All right. I'm not, I don't know why I'm having either, but I look forward to find out and I'll let you all know. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.